Hi, Denise. Hi. Hello. Hello. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. It's really fantastic to have you here, and uh, yes. it's really a pleasure to see you. Well, it's lovely for me too. I'm trying to remember when I saw you. Um, we, we met twice. Once you were in Coor for several days in 2002. Yes. Later on, you continued to, uh, to Geneva, of course. And there was another, um, there was a conference in Guimares in Portugal. Oh, yes. I think 10 years later. And we met yes. there again because I was, you were, you had a keynote and I was talking to. Yes. I was much younger. Um, you were a student the first time, weren't you? No, I was, I was already assisting, but I was a, mm -hmm. I was a student. I was, was, was assisting there. Um, just probably this could be just try to 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 show something because sometimes it's just easier yes. to I to seem to remember that. that you were riding a bicycle yes I always drive <laughs> and to you bicycle. went out to buy cakes for us <laughs> and you <laughs> arrived it's very late with the cakes on the front of the bicycle but more <laughs> content than that I do not remember <laughs> it's so lovely. That's typical me um, getting cakes and 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 all the stuff <laughs> which 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 I love. <laughs> but but you were late and you were coming with the cakes. <laughs> and, and I can't remember. The, there was a bit of tension. Where is he? What's he doing? We have to. <laughs> we had a but talk. I yes, and you were very young. Uh, yes, I was quite young still then, and um, uh, of course, uh, yes, I was. I was still. I was already. No, I, I was not already teaching. I started teaching a little bit later. Yes. And um, yeah, I tried to, to 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 keep up with the whole thing. But this was the initial thing for the thing we have tonight, because I learned the difference what you are doing, what Robert Venturi was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was completely clear what happened, or oh, what's what's the the, the 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 thing about, yeah. And well, uh, so it was clear for me that uh, when 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 the book came out from Frida that we need to 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 support it, and um, that's an important thing. Yes, that's wonderful. Um, it's it's a funny thing. A book, another book has come out just recently from um, Austria, from a mm -hmm. woman called Biljana Andrelovic. Okay. Yeah. And I haven't had a chance to see it yet. I believe your book is, the, the book from Frida is relatively expensive in our terms, but that book is $90. So I don't know who's going to buy it. <laughs> Which book? Her name is Biljana, and you remember we had a... Oh, um, yeah, yeah, Biljana, of course. Yeah. Yes, with her, and I helped her escape from Kosovo by sending her materials she could write about, and that got her a job in Austria. Oh, that's great. Perfect. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. But, but I I'd love to see the book, but I don't think anyone will ever see it. It's so expensive. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. I, I hope I will see it, at least. <laughs> I hope so too. Yeah, thank you. So I restarted Daniel now the the topic. Now it seems to work. I seem to be able to to share my PowerPoint. Shall we just try it quickly before we start? Uh yes, you can try. I just do um I will do a short introduction and then of course it okay, works. Great. Then we But I don't the... look like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a reminiscence of uh of uh, Coor <laughs> the last time. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think we went on to a famous house in the outskirts of Coor and um, a, a, a friend of ours in London wanted us to go and look at it. A house by an Englishman there, mm. an English architect. And yes. the whole family was still living in the house. It was very fascinating. But I can't remember the name of the architect. Uh, <laughs> Probably you mean the house of my grandmother uh, from Bailey Scott. 
Yes, yes. Oh, so I remember you were that. related to that family. Yes, uh, exactly. I was related to that family, and there was a discussion to 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 visit it somehow, but it yes. um, somehow never happened. Well, we did it. We went to see it. And uh, but my, uh, you went to see it. Yes, yes. Probably with Stanley von Moss. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, was, uh, my my grandmother is still alive. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. This one. That's the that's the the the, the, the book about the yes. house. And Robin is still my very good friend. We knew him from when we were both eighteen, and he phoned me from New York. He travels all over the world, and he has just turned ninety-two. He's an architectural historian, but he was the most genius architectural design, designer I ever met. <laughs> and he stopped the practice and became a historian. No, it's a fantastic house. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm astonished that you still remember this uh, thing, this relation. But yes, that's uh, exactly yes, Bailey that's Scott. One of the, yes. That's yes. one of the things uh, we, 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 we still take care on, and uh, which is very important. But... Yes, well, that's lovely. Please. Robin will be pleased to hear of that. He was a great admirer of that house. He's now an emeritus professor from Columbia. And he goes to different parts of the world and he meets a friend there and they travel together. Then he comes back to New York. And he's good to, he, he does things on his own that he shouldn't. He's 92. He shouldn't go up 200 floor steps in a, in a Japanese temple. He said, well, lots of people would catch me if I fell. Yes, but they're all Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> so, shall I start? Yes. Okay. Um, I make it very simple. Oh, it's really, a, it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you, Donnie Scott Brown here in my architecture theory course uh, of the University of Applied Science in the Grisen. I'm Daniel Walser. I invited uh, Frida Gran, who did uh, this wonderful book about you, which I think is really important. And the whole thing of today started in 2002. You, Dennis, uh, came to Kur with your husband, Robert Venturi, you held a lecture for us, the students. I was still assisting there. And it was a fantastic experience. This was directly the, the talk with the students we had. Um, there was a public lecture the day before, when I remember well. And we had a, a large talk. We had a talk about uh, what you do and, and, and what, are you, what your position is. And for me, it was completely clear it's not just Robert Venturi. It was completely clear you are very much uh, uh, you have a different position, much more in urbanism, much more in 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 the architecture. And this this it is this game in between these two minds uh, created at the end what we know as Robert Venturi and Donny Scott Brown. And this I'm always teaching with students, and this is a quite an important thing for me. And 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 and. And uh, the, when, I, when I talk about the whole concept, nevertheless, uh, I was super happy that you came and I published an, an article in the, in, in the newspaper and I talked about postmodernism. The first reaction I got from you is we have nothing to do with postmodernism. <laughs> Not altogether so were, true. I recanted were, that. <laughs> you were you were pointing out that you are much you see your position much more in functionalism. It's a function you are you were talking about, and which is very important, I think, to to realize that your position is not just I'm I'm, I'm being a bit but it's not a graphical one. It's not a formalistic one. It's really a position about architecture and its function and its and and and, and how architecture works. So it's even a development, a further development of architecture. Later, I distinguished it this way. I said, there is something that Philip Johnson does, and this is not what we do, and I call that POMO. And then there is postmodernism that came out of social movements and out of um, the Holocaust. 
in the first place, which few architects realized. And it came out of German authors who had a social uh, positions. And then out of that also came the architecture positions about complexity and contradiction and doubt and dealing with doubt and all of that. And I would call that our postmodernism. And so these these two books are really a for me a kind of 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 of, of interaction in be, that's a game in between and so it was uh, it's not the same posi position it's really a, an inter intellectual game as well to 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 broaden the 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 the, the idea of architecture and yes. well of contemporary yes. architecture yes and, 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 and then there's also the other thing that. Um, I, I also, right now, I say, um, down with the Athens Charter. Now, I was at La Serra's for the anniversary. And by the way, Frida told me they, they didn't put my talk in the publication, but I, I was there. And um, what, what I said is that Le Corbusier, as a wonderful architect, makes mistakes as an urbanist because he doesn't know enough. The things he doesn't know enough are about social things, uh, things we talk about now so much as sustainability, uh, transportation, all those things that go into making not only a city, but all the way up into making the functionalism of the bed relation to the bathroom. It's all part of a picture which must, architects must know about. So I, I say that um, when Le Corbusier uh, criticizes the donkey and says the mind is straight when the, the mind is clear when the streets are straight it's a lovely i love that but at the same time it's not always like that the donkey goes round a hill and has to go in circles to get the load up the hill so i say in the end um the donkey is a functionalist and le corbusier is an ass at least regarding urbanism. That's an aspect I was already very much interested when you were in Coor, because yes. I remember I remember that uh, Robert Venturi once said, I want to write a book, a book about Villa Savoie and Le Corbusier and this kind of thing. Even we were visiting an exhibition on Corbusier and his early life. Yes. So it's for me very interesting that you refer very fast on one hand to very immediately to 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 Philip Johnson and the 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 um, and Le Corbusier himself. Do you did you met him? Did I meet Le Corbusier? Yes. Did you met no, him? Did you no, meet? Never. No. I met Philip Johnson. It was not pleasant. But uh, that's. Uh, but you met several times Philip Johnson. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And he was very, very scared of me. Why? Because I wrote an article criticizing him. He loved to be admired and not to be criticized. There, there was an English journalist called David Dunster, a socialist and a friend of ours. And he went to a luncheon one day at the Four Seasons. He, Philip Johnson held them once a week. And he said the whole group were just worried because my article had come out and what would it do to their practice? And I thought, I'm not that influential. Why are they so worried? But you were. <laughs> yes. <definitely. laughs> well, it's getting more. It's getting more. We have a lovely young woman helping us here now. Um, she's from Mongolia. <laughs> she's she's very bright. She helps the, the computer and all of that. And she's she's that we had this party. I, I have not one caregiver. I'm you know I fell several times and I have to use a walker. And but she these my caregiver was a was dreadful and awful. And someone said you need seven friends who take it in turns people who enjoy you and who know, who are clever people. So we have set it up that way. And now I have seven people. They come you know, two days and another one comes two days and so on. We had a wonderful party last night with music, with klezmer music, with dancing, 
with um, flowers all over. Everyone brought flowers and everyone was um, singing happy birthday to me. And then I sang happy birthday right back to them. <laughs> <laughs> This is a lovely, lovely atmosphere and what you do need when you're a very old lady. Wonderful. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Rita, you prepared yeah. something. Probably yeah, sure. So I, I, can, I, can start, I can start at least with an introduction. <laughs> shall I, I shall start sharing. Yeah. Yes. So Frida Gran, uh, you are a teacher in no, you're 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 working on a, on a PhD in Minresium mm -hmm. on the postmodernism in Switzerland. You're originally from Sweden, where in this uh, in this this environment we even met some years ago, and that's for me it was so important to to to, to think about um, your book and your 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 work on Donny Scott Brown, and thank you very much. This is possible that you are here. Thank you so much, Daniel, um, for this introduction and, and for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here virtually uh, with you and with your students and, of course, with Denise Scott Brown. Uh, so happy birthday, dear Denise. Uh, to see, yeah, <laughs> this is for you. And it is really such an honor that you can spend a moment with us on your special day. So Denise is turning 92 today, so it's lovely to see you. So uh, again, Frida Graun uh, from Sweden, as Daniel said, I moved to Zurich in 2007 and graduated from ETH as an architect in 2010. And I returned there five years later for a postgrad study in the history and theory of architecture, which resulted in this thesis, uh, 2017. And for this work, I had a chance to talk with Denise on the phone, and that was the first time we spoke. And then I met her in person uh, in 2019. So now I've been working on a dissertation. Uh, in the last four years, I have continued this research on Swiss architecture and the influence of uh, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi in Switzerland in the 70s and 80s, primarily. And I look at media, for instance, this very famous interview by the art historian Stanislaus von Moos, who is also a good friend of Denise. And he wrote a lot about them as a couple and made them very well known in Switzerland in the 70s. But there were also other people who were not in direct contact, but who enjoyed their work very much, such as René Führer, who taught at each age. And uh, here we see his students and uh, one of his slides. Uh, and so he was in Las Vegas as well, uh, inspired by uh, Scott Brown and, and Turi. So I look at media education and the built reception and Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi's influence was so big that there was even a backlash to it in the 90s. And this is why they became for, a little bit forgotten for a while. But it interests me very much as a historian to understand this development and understand uh, what actually happened and why and how and how the ideas spread. So. While doing this research, I realized that Denise's idea had been very present in Switzerland, above all her work on Las Vegas and on pop art, on language and meaning in architecture. So uh, here you see a little bit of, of this in this article, which was um, uh, course literature in one of the courses. I hear myself kind of double. Perhaps it's good. If if you can turn off your microphone, but yeah, otherwise I will just ignore it. <laughs> um, so, so I also noticed that there were very few sources on Denise. So there was a lack of knowledge about her and her contribution to architectural discourse and a lot of misunderstandings. So people still today say things such as Venturi's Las Vegas and, and, and so on. So, in fact, it was Denise who discovered Las Vegas and the important book, Learning from Las Vegas, is built largely on her ideas. And it, is, and it intrigued me to find out more about her and the background of, of these ideas to understand her contribution better. 
So I ask, uh, ask the question, what about Denise? And this was also especially interesting because there is a connection between Denise Caprown and Switzerland um, because her parents moved to Geneva in the late 1960s. So here we see uh, Denise uh, on Lake Luzerne in the 80s and we see her mother, Phyllis Lakowski, in Geneva in 1999. So Denise and Bob Venturi visited uh, Geneva many times twice a year. So this book, which just came out last year, was released uh, for the 50th anniversary of learning from Las Vegas. Uh, and again, uh, Denise co-wrote Learning from Las Vegas with um, her husband and their collaborator, Steven Eisenhower. So how did I end up doing a book about Denise? As I mentioned, I visited her in 2019. And I had previously talked with her on the phone, but this was very different. So I just started my doctoral dissertation and I had an appointment for an interview. So the visit to her home gave me a deeper understanding of her life uh, and, and work. And we see examples of everyday things elevated to art, the sofa with Batman cushions, the wallpaper with a floral pattern they decide together designed, bent wood chairs for Knoll and books piled up everywhere. And on the wall is a painting by Robert Jinder of a Spanish revival house with a gilded sky like an orthodox icon. So meeting Denise made a very strong impression on me. So I was impressed by her charisma, her intellect, her warmth and generosity, and by the stories she told of her life, many of which were new to me. They were about Alison and Peter Smithson, about discussions with Aldo Rossi, about the civil rights movement, about her Jewish teachers in Johannesburg, London and Philadelphia. So doors kept opening to unexpected fields. And I, I realized how little is known about her. So time and again, the discrimination she faced throughout her career came up. And it was staggering to, to, to understand what this brilliant person had gone through. And I felt strongly that I needed to immerse myself in Denise's world to understand it and to do her justice. So a little later, after I'd returned to Switzerland, I met Elizabeth Bloom, who is one of the editors of the series, Bubbled Fundamenta. It was founded in 63 uh, to make architectural theory accessible to a wider audience, and a German-speaking audience in this case. And it also includes translation of learning from Las Vegas, as you see um, above, uh, Lern Lernen von Las Vegas. Um, published in the 70s. So Elizabeth spoke to me about an, her idea of publishing an anthology all about Denise and I was immediately interested and began to plan a concept and send out invitations to authors uh, to write essays for it. So I invited scholars who had previously published on Robert Venturi, of course, and The Office. And to my surprise, almost everyone said yes. And many contemporary scholars and architects felt a, a, a need, a desire to write about Denise. Uh, so 14 of the 25 texts are newly written historical essays that built on Denise's writings and unpublished archival sources. So there are also recollections by friends and colleagues of Denise to balance history, theory and personal memories. And the reception of this book has been amazing. We had a symposium at Yale School of Architecture in February this year, and Denise was present virtually. So this was a very wonderful experience for, for us all. And uh, many of the author, the, the chapters, uh, chapter authors were also present and, and uh, uh, presented their chapters in person. And we had a book launch at the Center for Architecture in New York, and there have been book talks in Berlin, in Frankfurt, in Kaiserslautern, in Milan, and Prague. And in Prague, Denise also joined us, which was wonderful. So the book has really been a great success. There is a really big interest in Denise's work, uh, which is amazing. And the first print already sold out, in fact. So 
as I mentioned, the book Learning from Las Vegas turned 50 last year. Uh, it is one of the most influential books on architecture theory of the 20th century. But there's so much more to Denise. And uh, this is what I'm trying to show in the anthology. Um, it aims to open up new perspective on her thinking in ways that reflect the broad range of her professional identities as an architect, planner, urbanist, theorist, writer, and teacher. So she's a mediator among professions, cultures, and continents. And, and she's, really, she's really made a mark on cultural discourse as few other uh, have done. And she, she's going beyond the fields of architecture and urbanism. So um, in this presentation now today, however, I'm kind of moving away from the book again. Uh, together with Daniel, we, I discussed um, if I should talk about the book or if I should give another presentation, which I prepared a couple of years ago. Uh, so I kind of prepared that in a way. So it will not be so much about the book. I will not go through all the chapters and so on, but talk more in general about Denise. The thing is, or the problem is that Denise's life and work, everything she's done is so rich. So it's almost overwhelming. So in, in half an hour, I won't be able to say much, actually. I will focus mostly on her background and on learning from Las Vegas and, and I, some of the ideas in there. Um, but I, it's impossible to say everything. I would need a whole semester to, to do that. <laughs> OK, so so this is a little bit of, a, of, a, of an introduction. Um, do you want to jump in? Anyone? Also, Denise, we're always happy to hear from you. Or Daniel. Yes, of course. Um, Otherwise, I will just continue. But uh, yeah, yeah, just continue. That's, I think that's uh, that's right. good. And then we, at the end, we, we, we yeah, I, I thought they would just give you an opportunity at least to interrupt. Yes. <laughs> All right. So uh, here we have um, Denise Cuff Brown. Uh, some some years ago. And um, so what, what I will argue and what I also argued in, in this presentation is that understanding her work and, and her biography before her collaboration with Robert Venturi is really important and it, to, 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 for us to comprehend um, recent architectural history, actually. So it makes it uh, easier for us to understand what happened recently. So Denise Scott Brown was born as Denise Lakovsky in 1931 in Kana in Zambia in a Jewish family with roots in Latvia and Lithuania. And her mother had studied architecture and had commissioned this beautiful modernist house. So, so Denise has a history with modernism. And Denise spent her youth in Johannesburg, a South African metropolis with a rich popular culture. And she was encouraged by an art teacher to draw her immediate surroundings to create original artwork. So most other children of immigrants would draw landscapes from their parents' native countries, but Denise would not. Instead, she started to pay close attention to her surroundings. This is, for instance, a commercial building in Quartier Natal in, in South Africa, a photo taken by Denise a bit later in the 50s. So she developed a heightened perception and ability to appreciate things that were almost invisible to most people. Uh, and these wonderful patterns here are painted by the Mapoch people. And so, and she opposed a, a kind of colonial mind frame that was dismissive of South African surroundings and experiences. And later in her life, she would keep this approach to what she experienced in America, to the American uh, everyday landscape, like here, for instance, in Las Vegas in the 60s. But moving it back again to South Africa, she began her studies of architecture uh, at University of Witzwaterstrand in Johannesburg in the late 1940s. She continued her architecture studies in London in 1952 to 54, where she met Alison and Peter Smithson. 
they were, became very important for her. They were part of an art of the artist collective, the independent group, which also used their immediate surroundings as creative material. So street life, the commercial vernacular, popular culture. They were also members of Team 10 and the founders of New Brutalism. So they would take part in several exhibitions such as Parallel of Life and Art, and this is tomorrow at the Whitechapel Gallery. And all of this is popularly known as the birth of pop art. So this was a very important uh, phenomenon uh, back then at, at the time. And it developed in the wake of the booming post-war economy of the United States. So it was a way of dealing or processing this new Americanized culture, mass media and consumerism. So images from uh, advertisement produced in collages as comments on new reality. And the abstraction and purity of the modern movement was replaced by the ordinary. Do you want to jump in, Denise? No, no, you do beautifully. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Yes. So nice to see you. I continue. So, and one interesting aspect is that this appreciation and interest in the existing environment would have an urban and social component as well. So the Smithsons reflected upon the human habitat and needs uh, in this exhibition. This is tomorrow. Um, they were also members of SIAM, and SIAM was an important organization for functionalist architects, but they became increasingly critical and uh, would uh, found uh, what, what I mentioned uh, was called Team 10. So they were part of a growing opposition to functionalist city planning. And uh, the Smithsons advocated for a more humane modernism, for identity and belonging, and Denise was a student at the time, but the way of thinking uh, influenced her and also confirmed the ideas she had brought with her from South Africa. So after a discussion, she decided to study urbanism. And the most interesting place to do that was in Philadelphia. But before that, Denise married her fiancé, Robert Scott Brown. And here we see the couple in Venice in the 50s. And they traveled all over Europe and attended the CM Summer School in Venice, where the growing critique of the function of the city was also present. Then they did an internship in Rome and so on. Must have been time. They arrived in Philadelphia in 1958 and started studying together there. But one year later, Oxford Brown sadly died in a car accident. And she immersed herself in work and studies to deal with this terrible loss. So she studied urban planning at the University of Pennsylvania, where the sociologist Herbert Gans was an important teacher. And he was part of a tradition of American sociologists who looked at the number day to seriously. And he's famous for his study on the lived towns and development. Um, and these, the lived towns, they were large suburban housing schemes built after the war. And Gans looked at this um, and other urban phenomena, and he encouraged his students to visit cities such as Los Angeles and Las Vegas to find out why they were so popular, why they were growing so fast. And Gans's thinking would inspire later research and design studios at the Yale School of Architecture on Las Vegas and Levittown by Denise and Venturi. So after graduating at the Department of City Planning, Denise was hired as an instructor and promoted uh, as an assistant professor at the age of 29. She developed an interdisciplinary teaching method based on urban analysis focusing on hidden patterns and forces of urban environments. And here we see Denise teaching at Penn, the University of Pennsylvania, in the early 1960s. And Denise's teaching serves as a testing ground for ideas about the street as a design element and about the communi communicative power of the city. Ideas that would form the thesis for a later uh, project in Las Vegas. And during these years, she developed an interdisciplinary teaching method, again, based on urban analysis, 
courses, as I said. Denise, Denise Kirk Brown and Robert Lanceri in 1960, and they started what would become a lifelong collaboration. Venturi taught an architecture theory course, and they would work together on the exercises part, exercise part, sorry, of their courses until 1964. And uh, during this time, Bob Venturi worked on another famous book, um, Complexity and Contradiction Architecture. And for the book, he uses examples from his course, but also some ideas from Denise's lectures on urbanism. And the architecture historian Mary McLeod writes that Scott Brown was one of few people that influenced Venturi, pushing him to extend his argument beyond his Princeton Rome formalism and to consider complexity and contradiction in a broader social framework. And Venturi's famous assessment of Main Street as being almost all right can be seen as a summary of uh, Denise's position. So, speaking of social framework, the struggle for social equality was on the top of the agenda in the 1960s. So the critique of modernist city planning, as we as I mentioned, was paralleled by the civil rights movement, with demands for participation in the urban planning process. South Street was an African-American low-income area of downtown Philadelphia that was threatened um, by demolition uh, in order to build a, a highway. So one of Scott Brown's first projects was as an, as an advocacy planner for this area to save um, the, 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 the buildings, the population and, and the business owners and prevent them from having to, to move from there. And an important part of her work was photographic documentation, as you see here in, in these beautiful images. And in these photos, um, she, she shows the poetic quality of this neighborhood. And her approach was that functioning communities should be preserved. Why should they be replaced by something, something else? So it was important for her to understand people's preferences and way of life in traditional downtown areas or in the suburbs for that matter. So she was opposed to the modernist urge to tidy up the, the inner city. And she has written about this in several articles in which she urges her colleagues to open their eyes and learn from the existing environment. In 1965, Scott Brown was invited to teach first at UC in Berkeley and then at UCLA in Los Angeles, where she actually uh, was part of, of, of the founding the program there and, and, and uh, building it, uh, where she also be would become an associate professor. And uh, Denise's central research tool was town watching, and this was conducted on the freeway, but also from the helicopter. So see here, and these are Denise's photographs. And uh, Denise would spend about two years in LA. And here we see again, her interest in the everyday and the commercial vernacular. And she would later write that in 1965, of the 10 years of urbanism, my foci were automobile cities of the American Southwest, social change, multiculturalism, action, everyday architecture, massive vitality, iconography, and pop art. So this is a summary of her priorities. And while in Los Angeles, Scott Brown visited Las Vegas four times and decided to teach a studio on the city. And driving through the desert reminded Denise of her native Africa. And she would later describe her perception of the city as an African view of Las Vegas. So she was an, an urban scientist, you can say, from another continent, looking at environment um, from an outside perspective. And this photograph here, uh, one of the nieces is called Architettura Minore on the Strip. It was taken in 1966. 
And she would return three times on her own and decided to run a studio um, on Las Vegas at UCLA. But this plan changed after she invited Venturi to join her for another trip. So in November 1966, they went together. And Venturi was as fascinated by the city as Veniska Brown was. And a year later, they married in Santa Monica and they returned to Philadelphia together, where Denise became a partner of the architecture office that Bob Venturi ran together with John Rauch. But the office would continue to be called Venturi and Rauch, however, until 1980. So that took a while. Um, in 1968, the couple conducted their first design and research studio together at Yale School of Architecture and results, uh, as I think many of you know, and as I, as I said, were published in Learning from Las Vegas uh, in 72. And uh, again, book became very influential. And it was a second edition in 77 with an addition to the title. So learning from Las Vegas, the forgotten symbolism of architectural form. And this is important. Uh, this made clear that this book was actually a treatise on symbolism in architecture. And I, was, I will focus a little bit on this now um, for, some, for some time. There are so many aspects of this book, so I could talk about other things as well, but this, this is uh, what I, I've been uh, focusing on here. Um, here we see some of the students uh, conducting research. So the students explore the readability of this kind of new car-centered city. And it was a city that was sort of untouched by the purism of the modern movement. So it was a good example. And Denise writes that she, she put her skills and disciplines learned on three continents from two, two professions and eight years of teaching in architecture and planning into the Las Vegas studio. And uh, her training in urban analysis is really crucial uh, for this kind of research. Um, and here we, we see some of the most uh, important outcomes of, uh, uh, of, of the Las Vegas studio. These were ideas that uh, uh, Denise and Bob Venturi developed. So the duck is uh, Denise's uh, the decorated shed, more uh, Venturi's. And these terms are still used very frequently in architectural discourse in criticism and, and, uh, uh, and theory of, of architecture. So, so the city was really full of signs and they were either freestanding um, or applied to facades, as we see on the right, the decorated shed, or they formed the shape of an entire building, as in the duck. And uh, there was a big need for communication in this environment. Um, many people went by car at high speed over, and they, they looked at signs over large distances. Uh, so this created a pop landscape covered in signs. And as we've seen before, uh, advertisement was connected to pop art. And Andy Warhol I would even state that once you got pop, you could never see a sign the same way again. So, so the signs were considered co as cultural artifacts. They invoke the wealth of images, like the flamingo sign here that represents a dream vision of Florida or a tropical island. Uh, other um, casinos refer to historical places like Imperial Rome. We see here a Roman guard uh, uh, in front of Caesar Palace, combined uh, with a very American parking lot. So. In the architecture of Venturi, Rauch and Scott Brown, they prefer the typology of the B version of the decorated shed. So uh, with a communicating outer layer, like almost like a billboard. And uh, we see this in the Vanna Venturi house on the left. And we also see that in the National Football Hall of Fame, it has really a, a giant billboard. So these were two very early um, examples where we, we see this very clearly. Um, another topic they, they talk about in, in Learn from Las Vegas are, are again, freestanding signs. They compare them to obelisks found on piazzas in Rome uh, because both fill a function as communicative elements. 
So this uh, comparison here was um, was quite uh, provocative uh, at the time to to kind of overlap uh, Las Vegas with with Rome uh, in this way. Um, but today it's not really. But but back then it was really kind of uh, provocative and outrageous. Um, and then. Um, to say a few more words about the duck, it was originally from the fast food joint, Long Island Ducklin. It is a playful uh, metaphor, and it was also really a critique of late modernist architecture. And this is a point that is not <clears throat> always for, um, understood, uh, because they say that that modernist, uh, late modernist architecture, such in, in, in this example on the right, was almost like a duck because it was not readable, it was not understandable as a building, so it becomes more of a symbol in itself, really. Until this point, Denise had taken an active role in architectural debate, and here are some of her articles from the 60s. So she, she writes a lot about um, pop art, for instance, and she promoted the artist Ed Rocher. She was very inspired by his work, and they used an uh, Ed Rocher inspired um, uh, illustration in learning from Las Vegas. So Los Angeles and Las Vegas were both recorded in, a, in, in this meticulous uh, deadpan documentary way, uh, almost as if they were uh, ready-made works of art. And Ed Rocher would continue um, uh, with his development. But there are other aspects of this, however. So the fascination for, for signs and, and in the shape of advertisement, but also signs in themselves, was part of a larger discourse in post-war architecture. And this was this is called semiotics. And I won't go into detail here, but Umberto Eco was very important, um, the Italian philosopher and semiotician. And, and he also wrote uh, uh, other uh, books. He became famous as an, an author. Um, and he argues that different, sh different shapes of architectural elements convey different meanings. For instance, a horizontal window has a very different connotation than a Gothic pointed arch. So in his, this argument, we can see again in Learning from Las Vegas, and they write, uh, commenting on their own project, Guildhouse, that the sign saying Guildhouse denotes meaning through its words. As such, it is the heraldic element par excellence. The character of the graphics, however, connotes institutional dignity, while contradictorily, the size of graphics connotes commercialism. So this play with denoting and connoting is really um, from, yeah, you can say from Umberto Eco. And of course, it's also related to Charles Jenks and his uh, book on postmodern architecture and his other book on meaning in architecture. So this is all part of one uh, discourse in the 70s. So pop and postmodernism were both sort of a return to content and meaning that you're conveying a message, this idea. But the question is, uh, what kind of content would you could you convey? So Jenks encouraged architects to use a large variety of sources to reflect a diverse society. And this was also something that Mr. Brown and, and Victoria did. So um, they combined references to the everyday, to vernacular and to history, not to be orthodox. They didn't want to create a new orthodox style like the modernists had done, sort of. And this can be seen uh, in the architecture, again, of Denise and Bob. Uh, for instance, in the houses on Nantucket Island and on Block Island, as you see here, very nice um, regionally inspired houses. They use references to local vernacular uh, shingle style, but in a transformed way. So, um, and the symbolism of housing, so symbolism of the everyday would be the topic of another studio at Yale School of Architecture focused on Levitt Town. As we saw before, uh, Herbert Gans, uh, Denise's old teacher, was very important here in, as inspiration for this. And this resulted in an exhibition in Washington in 1976. Um, and uh, they, it, they focused quite a lot on suburban housing and looked at almost identical houses of these large uh, areas in, in Levitt Town. And um, the results, again, of the studio here in the exhibition. 
Uh, here we see some examples of downtown row houses along a street. And here a suburban house with symbolic comments or, or comments um, um, on the style of the, the different elements that you see in, in this house. So for instance, formal colonial gardens or Cape Cod shingles. So these are really used as symbols to express the identity of the owner. So here the, the owner of the house is using different symbols or different architectural elements to express uh, his or her identity. And this is studied in this exhibition. And another uh, exhibit was this uh, living room where we see the same thing, basically, how the, the furniture uh, are also used as symbols <laughs> to, to, uh, to express the identity of uh, the person who's living here, for instance, Regency style uh, and so on. So, so this way of uh, approaching reality with a critical distance, kind of looking looking at it a little bit from 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 the outside, you can say, is also seen in in pop artworks such as the Andy Warhol's Campbell soup can, which has a very ordinary form. You see this in every uh, American supermarket, but um, the the artwork is very large in size. Uh, and you see these in these other examples in other in different ways uh, as well. For instance, Roy Lichtenstein, who is mimicking um, the print of a comic, but it, it is painted actually, so it is an oil painting. So the artistic transformation of sources is made through a change of context, scale or material. And uh, uh, Denise Brown uh, and Venturi write in the exhibition catalog, pop artists used unusual juxtapositions of everyday objects in tense and vivid place between old and new associations to flout everyday interdependence of context and meaning, giving us a new interpretation of 20th century cultural artifacts. The familiar that is a little off has a strange and revealing power. So this is very, is a good summary really of their approach. And uh, in architecture, it is seen, for instance, in this, uh, what's called the ironic column at Allen Memorial Art Museum um, in Ohio. And it has a very exaggerated shape and it is clad in wood. So here we see this, this way of, of, of using a traditional element in an unusual way. Um, so the, the idea here is that they didn't want to invoke a neo-historicist style like architects did in the 19th century. The symbols should stay symbolic and they should not try to become what they were referring to. So the use of, of irony and transformation is really crucial here. So, and they, they criticized colleagues who had learned the wrong lessons from complexity and contradiction and kind of used this literal um, history, yeah, used uh, historical consequences literally. And uh, Venturi would even uh, complain, lament that his book was used as a license for historicizing styles. So, um, and he's saying here that that basically were mannerist architects. Um, so uh, we use the past in our designs, but we use it incorrectly. And this was also seen, um, there were different approaches present at the Venice Biennale uh, in 1980. And this was uh, definitely one uh, important um, standpoint seen back then. So here are some of the contributions. And here is the contribution by Venturi Rauch and Scott Brown. And they used the Biennale to make a statement against this literal, the symbolic, ironical temple gable in front of the Van Venturi house layers present in many of the projects by Denise and Bob Venturi, such as the Sainsbury Wing of the National Gallery in London. And here the stone cladded, stone cladded facade, sorry, is treated as a curtain that folds at the corner and reveals a glass building behind. So you see that on the on the very right side. And this project, which is considered one of the best um, of, of the office, was mainly designed um, uh, by, by Denise. And we have been talking about so. Uh, this opened in 1991 
And now it is threatened by a very insensitive uh, renovation. So, and there's also a petition to stop these plans. Um, and it is online on change.org. Uh, uh, sorry. So please sign this petition. Um, and this is another important project in which, uh, which Denise played a major role, the provincial capital um, uh, in Toulouse in France. It is a parliament building that served as a laboratory um, for, for trying out how this urban analysis, for instance, can be uh, used in, in, a, in a real project. And uh, it uh, shows uh, um, a large, um, how 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 Denise um, really worked uh, very uh, intensely on on a project, uh, especially on the diagonal, for instance, uh, which was uh, her idea. So so this very uh, important strong uh, gesture here going through the uh, the site, and the diagonal connects the medieval city center with a nearby shopping center. And here again, we see an elevation, which also has this kind of, of uh, symbolic memory or symbolic reference, uh, in this case, to gate towers, uh, which we just stand at this location. And these images are from a presentation Denise used to give about this project, and they show where her interests lie. Um, on the context, the river, the movement in the city, on materiality and shapes from the surroundings. So she's really learning from Toulouse. And uh, here is one of Denise's own images from the context in Toulouse, showing the reality around the building. So these are were some of her architectural projects, but she did so much more. She did a lot of, of planning projects, campuses, preservation projects such as this in the coal mining city of Jim Thorpe. But in spite of everything she's done, Venturi was awarded the Pritzker Prize alone. And the, the, the jury stated that Venturi looked with fresh eyes at the architectural landscape of America and the, uh, described the inherent honesty and beauty of ordinary buildings. So and this sounds very much like Denise. <laughs> so it it's, it's really seems fair to say that she, yeah, she should have been awarded this prize and it was, was partly for her. Um, anyhow, at the, the prize ceremony, Venturi, um, <clears throat> this was a part of Venturi's speech, and I, I will just uh, read it uh, because it's, it's quite nice. He says, or said, and last, you will notice during this loosely chronological description, I have used more and more the first person plural, that is we, meaning Denise and I. All my experience representing appreciation support and learning from would have been less than half as rich without my partnership with my fellow artist Denise Scott Brown. There would be significantly less dimension within the scope and quality of the work this award is acknowledging today, including dimensions theoretical, philosophical and perceptive, especially social and urban, pertaining to vernacular, to mass culture, from decorative to original design, and in the quality of our design, where Denise's input, creative and critical, is crucial. So this is um, where his words back then. Later years have seen an overdue recognition of Denise's work um, in the award of the gold medal uh, uh, from the American Institute of Architects in 2016, together with Venturi, and in the first sole exhibition of her work in Vienna in 2018. And then again, of course, the, the book, the anthology and the symposium at Yale this year, which I showed in the beginning. So. It is really impossible to summarize Denise's theory in less than one hour. <laughs> uh, again, it would, would really need a full semester. But if you're interested, you can continue to read about her ideas, for instance, in these books here, and of course, in Learn from Las Vegas. And there are there's still so many misconceptions on what she stands for. And, and her thinking really goes beyond the view from the car and, and her research is about understanding the forces that influence cities and um, 
Uh, and, and honorability is, is only one of them. So she's known for celebrating the vitality of the contemporary city, its richness, layers, and contrasts, and her, her genius lies in her ability to channel transdisciplinary knowledge into new synthesis. Uh, and this has really enriched architecture's set of techniques. And I also, yeah, I want to pinpoint Denise's uh, own conceptual contributions. They have been, many of them have been wrongly attributed to Venturi. Uh, so although the ideas were developed collectively, uh, Denise's contribution really deserves recognition in its own right. So thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Frida, for your <coughs> speech, your 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 putting Dernes into the architecture world and and pointing out a bit really her contribution, which I think is an important thing. Um, we talked already for hours. If I come, if I calculate what we what we did until now, and one thing I was very much. But which, but which I think is a very good sim uh, symbol for what you said is there. There was a once um, a photograph taken at a dinner or after a dinner with Philip Johnson in New York, and the photographer asked Donnie's to be removed from the people sitting there for the photograph. And this was very touching for me when I when you told me this story because it really describes that you are extremely engaged, but still overseen. And that's why I think it's so important to, 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 to fill the gap of this absence uh, mm -hmm. as, as a contribution to, to the architecture. I mm -hmm. really hope we are in a different world today. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, it's uh, for me, it's, it's, it was always clear. I, I, I I mean, other, I made, you know, this gender thing was never a thing of mine. I always was a bit irritated about it, but I'm, I know careers in Switzerland, like Lisbeth Sachs um, or Geisendorf in Sweden, two mm -hmm. women who studied together uh, in Sur at ETH Zurich. And even Geisendorf had this, she stumbled a bit in, in Sweden, but she did work, she could work. Mm -hmm. Leonie, yeah. um, but but it was impossible to work as a woman for Lisbeth Sachs in Switzerland. Yeah. Almost, it was very difficult for her to find work, to to be independent, and um, so I I was even I did a lecture as well on that because I think it was really important to 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 think about uh, what what really the the role of it. Um, so it, but it's not just a Swiss theme; it's really an international question we have in all levels, in all intellectual levels. And that's the disturbing thing. It's not just about, you know, the worker who doesn't take a woman um, for serious if you tell him to do it something different in the building site. It's mm -hmm. even in the, in the intellectual world where we th talk about thoughts and we talk about theory and so on. And mm -hmm. that's this, this is something I, 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 I just can't understand but that's mm -hmm. a very simple thing um, and mm -hmm. what i appreciate extremely about the work of Dennis of Dennis is not just that you that you focused on 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 let's say on architecture it's you had a message to give that's why teaching was important uh, even teaching is not just about Telling something how somebody how to do something teaching is about learning as well. So it's a it's a this 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 you this this learning and teaching comes very much together and bringing into practice and developing out of this game between practice and teaching learning theory. And I think that's an important thing that you don't try to disconnect this kind of thing. I think. I'm completely convinced that today when we try to distinguish these professions from each other, we 
fail the essence of architecture. But that's uh, my own thing. Um, Donis, uh, where do you think your contribution was most important in this discourse of theory, teaching, building, research? Where do you think you see your position as, 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 a, as an important new jump into different things? I don't know. I have a very, very full mind and a very, very full life. And I see Frida's wonderful interpretation and she has a wonderful mind. But Thank you. I, at, at 92, I'm still rather puzzled. The students, in a way, saved my life. Mm. Having, having a research to do that challenged us all, and we all had problems, and they came to me for help but they will still challenge themselves to go look for themselves and they come back and I'd learn from them and them from me. And our knowledge grew in a team in that way. And evolving that studio me mechanism was not mine, but I have used it in a way that hadn't been used uh, from the people that taught me that. The studio was taught as one student and one teacher. And you didn't even bother to go to the juries of the other students. You stayed away until it was your problem. Mm -hmm. But by the time we were doing the learning from Las Vegas, everyone had to look at everything because they couldn't learn about their project without the help of the other people. And mm -hmm. to me, that's, that's been a, a wonderful widening for me. If, if I, I started in that kind of learning when I was seven years old in a progressive school where we learned by projects. And um, you to to learn, you made you made you learned by doing. At seven, we were um, making models of primitive housing from different cultures. One was African, others were uh, Zulu, Indian, and six of us little girls. We had a Canadian teacher, and we were trying to make this house, the Zulu house, which is made out of wattle, and then you put twigs between wattle, they're called utingo. And um, then after that, you put mud and then a thatched roof. And we had a big piece of um, uh, um, uh, plywood, quarter inch plywood. And we had big nails to stand for the wattle. And we nailed the nail in and it held very nicely. And then we went to do the second nail we banged at that and the first one came out. <laughs> now you have seven little girls, very, very, um, very emotionally involved, very angry, frustrated, the teacher just the same. And she goes away and by the morning, she's worked out what to do. Now it means you learn grown ups have problems too. You learn she can deal with the problems. You learn how you can deal with the problems. And eventually we built the whole thing. We glued them all in and then we put the mud in them, and then the straw. And we made a lovely thing that we were proud of. And that's the kind of, she, she was what later we called a player coach. The teacher's right along there with you working on the project. And, and, and then your ideals grow and your enthusiasm grow and you're all working late at night. I had students who were never intending to be architects. They were good to be planners of one sort or another. And um, I'd give them things to make that they say it's got no relation to anything we're doing. And they'd sit there at night and they'd be such a perfection of people, they couldn't stop. I remember I had one student and he's sitting there, I've given him a problem, make a, a plan and then um, a, a card model, a paper card model of a room where you painted the walls in such a way that if you stayed in that room too long, you'd go crazy. That was the problem. And he sits there and he makes this little room and he makes it beautifully and it gets later and later and he's up at midnight. So, and he says, but I'm going to be a political scientist. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I love the way that their creativity came out and they couldn't stop whether they wanted to or not. And it happens to me too. But I'm so puzzled. I don't know. I don't know what it is quite. I did, it. and I, I know what I wanted to do, and I'm very happy. I'm very happy for the relationship 
was Frida, but before Frida came Stanley and Irene, and they were wonderful friends here and also in Switzerland. And um, even now I have all these good friends who, who um, stay overnight and then go home and then come back another two nights. They gave me a great party last night. And um, so it, 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 we were all dancing and singing and they, they produced wonderful food and we had the dogs there too and we had the whole thing happening. And I, I felt and today I got a letter from someone I'd not been thinking about for a long time, Ariane Hebley. Ariane <laughs> Hebley is a, a wonderful Dutch architect, and he's been a close friend and his, his <laughs> former wife too, very close friends. And I was thinking of him yesterday, and today there was a card from him. So <laughs> if I say hello to Ariane in all of this, I, I try not to forget these great these great friends and wonderful people. Great. I think that's that's what I could say. Sometimes I, I, I'm an old woman and sometimes I cry. I don't know why I cry, I just cry. And um, <laughs> this morning I saw two members of Congress, women, um, one um, now retired, and the other still a member of Congress, and they're both crying on television. Mm. I forget why, but she's wiping her eyes. And the, the, mm. the female commentator says, I'm not going to say it for you. You're going to have to say it for yourself. And there she is crying and commenting. And, you know, I have friends who help me not to do that, but I still do it. Mm. Yeah. So thank you, all you friends. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Denise, really, for, for being here, for being such an inspiration, really. Yeah. Frida, you, have a, uh, you want to uh, ask a question? Um, <laughs> I, I've asked so many questions uh, through so many years. <laughs> you have a lovely full mind and a very good way of organizing it. And Thank you've been you. Very, very kind to us. And <laughs> you say, when I sent that letter to Biliana, you said, it's written so beautifully. If yeah. people write the scholarly things that other people can't understand, and mm -hmm. this letter was just understandable to her. And so you published my letter, and you published, I think you published her letter too. Yeah, so, so yes. this is, uh, this is how And you were out. very, uh, very open to what you would accept in the book, and I love that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it is very nice, and I think that that really helps sometimes to, to write uh, a very good text, to have a person in mind that you're addressing. Yes. Then, yes. yeah, that it really makes your thoughts flow in, in a yes. you know, way that is uh, understandable for another person. <laughs> Yes, and then you had one of my students who did not become an architect. He was a social planner. He mm -hmm. was a cheeky, rude young thing. And I once said to him, um, what did I say? What you have just said should not be said by a graduate student, should not be said by an undergraduate student, should not be said by a high school student. Now he's 84 and I'm 90 or something. And I, I say to him, um, didn't you feel bad when I said that to you? He said, Denise, I knew exactly what I was doing. He was teasing me. <laughs> and so, but on the other hand, he's come back and he talks. He became not a planner at all. He became a, a, a career diplomat, an American career diplomat. And he was, um, he was ambassador to Burundi in Africa. He spoke French and English. And one day they called him down to Johannesburg to meet with Mandela because he knew about the housing in Africa that I had showed him in pictures in that course. So he went four times to help Mandela make policy about housing in Africa. And that's a lovely achievement too. Mm. That's true. And it was, it was amazing. Uh, his name is uh, 
uh, Jim Yellen. Yes. And, and James Yellen. Um, and he, he, he writes uh, here in the book, he wrote a chapter. Yes. And he was one of Denise's first students in 1960. Yes. And uh, an amazing person because he, he, he sent me an email a couple of, uh, for, for many reasons, but, but one, one thing which really uh, impressed me was that he uh, wrote to me in June uh, and said, uh, so Frida, I'm in Europe right now. I'm making a, a movie about uh, planning in Ukraine. Uh, he was making a film in Kiev. Yeah. I kept yeah, saying, exactly. come back, it's not safe. Yeah, exactly. At at his age also, and yeah. and Keith and every you know Ukraine, so uh, and he, so he wrote and said that he was there and said, okay, so I might be coming to Zurich. Uh, would you be there uh, in a in a few days? And I said, no, I will give a book talk in Prague. <laughs> but please come there if you like. <laughs> Denise would be very happy to see you because she will be online. And so he came to Prague <laughs> just for this uh, just for this He's event. A real adventure sometime. Yeah. But he writes very nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I think is interesting with you, Donis, and your your work, and you, of course, you are often seen as 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 American because you you live there and 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 you work there, but you have a special relation with Switzerland. Can you talk a bit about this? Because I think it's not so usual that uh, you are. You were often here, you visit a lot of people. What's your relation? And um, well, let, let me start somewhere else. I just have to put this back in again. Have I got this right? Um, you see, to know about my relation with Switzerland, you have to start with my parents leaving Latvia and Lithuania and mm -hmm. going to northern Rhodesia and southern Rhodesia and going to lion country and where everything that you had, you had to make yourself. And living 15 minutes, 15 miles away from Bulawayo, but that 15 miles had lion country. They had a, they had a, a bush doctor. She was, she was also from Latvia. She studied in, studied in Pavia, and she drove in the desert, rather in, the, in, the, in that lion landscape to look after patients. So people, from all over the world were there. And it was the same in Africa during the war and so many refugees fled. So I grew up with English teachers, um, uh, German teachers, um, American teachers, Canadian teachers, all sorts, as well as Afrikaans teachers. I grew up to be a liberal. I have um, a feeling about all those populations, but my mother and her brothers, they had um, uh, they had homeschooling because you couldn't walk anywhere to school. And they, were, they had an English governess who had also lived in Switzerland many years. So they learned English and French, and they learned nature study, and they learned all sorts of things. Um, being from, from um, Latvia, you, you had um, a high sense of what's life of what what's civilization and so every every everywhere where my family went and they're all over the world they have a grand piano and we have a picture of that grand piano it arrives from from cape town in bulawayo and then they put it they, they um, cover it carefully and very well and then they put it on an ox wagon and it goes up the the, 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 un, the dry river that would take them where next week will take them to their farm. So you see this grand piano arriving in an ox wagon. And as soon in there, my mother's playing it, my, my, my grandmother's playing it, and other women through, all through our life because it came then back with us to Africa, to South Africa. So if you see this thing where you have the culture which is around you, which is very strong, and then these other cultures. So I wanted to speak French because my mother spoke French. And so when I went to school, I did not take Latin. I took Afrikaans, thank God, because with Afrikaans, I can understand most Germanic languages one way or another. And then later trips in Spain with some German students, Nazi students, they'd been in Mapola. And here I am Jewish and I go, 
to Spain with them and we argue about what happened. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they were mortified by what happened, but maybe not so much anyone anymore, but they were then. And we just talked and talked and talked and talked about that problem. And, but in the meantime, I learned German and I learned Afrikaans and I learned Italian, I learned French. So I love that. And I love being in a place in Switzerland, in Geneva, I found I was in the supermarket there. It's like an American one, but one seventh the size. And so you, you're in that, and suddenly there's an old man on the outskirts, and he's an old man with a big stomach, and he's got his hand up. He's saying, Hilfe, Hilfe. So I say to him, Mein Herr, ich möchte sich wie like helfen. As soon as he hears me, he speaks English to me. Mm -hmm. He speaks very good English. He's an Arab. And, then, and they come from the Grands Ensemble where my parents live. And so he, he says his wife is ill in bed, but she wants to make bread and she sells her, sent them out for some yeast. So <laughs> I turn to these French people, French speaking Swiss, who will not speak German for anything, not for anything. So <laughs> I say to them, what is the name of the thing that when you put it in the bread, it makes the bread get higher? Not very good French, but good enough. He says, Oh, they say, oh, la velure. <laughs> so I'm a white South African Jewish coming from America, and I translate for people who are of the same country. And that's, a, that's to me, a, a, a lots of fun. Mm. Amazing. And then you had as well an exchange, let's say, ETH, Stanislaus von Moos, and so on. There was even this private life. Your mother was in Geneva, but there was as well as well another exchange, or was this not yes, so? No. Um... no, that's and you see, uh, Mire Turatini now she used to be um Laminier, but they divorced, and Laminier was came as a visitor to teach at Penn. Yes. But my mother and and Mire became good friends, and then we became more friends with Mire than with Jean Marc. Mm -hmm. um, Jean-Marc was somewhat proud and a fascist and he, mm -hmm. he was a good person but he should not have behaved the way he did. So Mireille has been a close friend and she lived 13 years in California and then she came back to America and mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to Switzerland and so we saw a lot of her whenever we were there and um, I used to call her a, a, Californ a, a Swiss California golden girl. And she's very really beautiful, even as a young woman, I could see when you saw her. So those are close friends of ours. And then um, um, uh, also, um, uh, Irene, Irene's mother, lived very near us in Geneva. So oh, yeah. when we went there, we quite often saw her, even though she was coming from, um, uh, see, I forget names, um, from where you, from, Oh, come on. The, the other, not Geneva. Zurich. Zurich, yes, she's coming from <laughs> Zurich, but I often saw her there. Find yeah. her walking in the park, and there she was. So she was a very good friend. And I think she is in California now with their family who's there. I don't know if she's back in, in Geneva much. Yeah. Okay. But maybe a quick question. Um, it's just a detail. Uh, I'm sorry to talk about Jean-Marc Lamounier, <laughs> but, but uh, he was a, 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 an architect in Geneva. Um, and uh, he met uh, Bob Venturi in 1967. Who they were um, Jean-Marc Lamounier yes, yes. met Bob uh, at Penn uh, yes, in right. 1967. Yes. So they were they were on the same jury. So they were they were critics yes. on the same jury. Do you do you know who uh, who invited them to to be on this jury? This is a question I have. This is very specific. <laughs> um, Jean Marc was invited to come over and be a visiting professor at Penn. Yeah, yeah. And that's how he would have been on the jury. But whose yeah. jury it was, I'm not sure. Yeah. But Jean Marc was a very intelligent person, mm. quite a nasty person in some ways. Mm. And by the way, Inez Lamounier, I mm. 
she came over once and spent five weeks with her father because he was teaching. He came rather regularly. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went looking around and I found a school for her that would take her. Yeah. And she, she went to this school and they were very good. They say we would find out where she was in class and we'd devise separate lessons for her if necessary. And so we had a friendship with, with uh, her as well mm -hmm. as a result of that. Yeah. Um, so th it was a rather regular thing. And I think Mireille came sometimes and not other times. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I don't know what happens to old men, but they rush off with other women. And mm -hmm. So the whole thing broke up. And, mm -hmm. and, um, but I, I found that he was flattering to me. But he's also anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Oh no! And he was left-wing, mm -hmm. but in a very theoretical way. Mm. And his uh, his buildings were talented, but very constrained. They're very structurally yeah. constrained by, you know, by, by modes and and um, I, you know, uh, it is it's just very modern in a way that didn't depart in any way that seemed interesting to me yeah so he had this research project in the 70s about user participation and he was trying to develop a code between the architect and the user uh -huh. in in lausanne back then at epfl did he ever tell you about that no 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 Okay, because because Jacques Gubler, who you also know, the Swiss historian, yes. uh, he, I, I was very amused by Gubler. He's 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 a very very interesting guy. Yes. Um, he writes in a book that Jean Marc Lamounier was probably inspired by you and by your advocacy planning. He probably was, but he wasn't going to tell me that. No, exactly. One, that was what I yes. thought. And one day we he had a visitor, and he wanted the visitor to meet Venturi. Mm -hmm. And I was there, and my mother was there. Mm -hmm. And my mother spoke to them as if they were ordinary human beings. But of course, they looked at her, and they just looked down and went on with their talking. Mm -hmm. I said, my mother, it's no use trying to interfere in the conversation of those two lions trying to impress each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. But he also talked with my sister, and he made her very angry because he said, some quite anti-Semitic things, I think. Oh God. Mm. Mm. So your your sister lived in New York. Um, one sister lived in New York. She oh, yeah. died. Oh yeah. And the other one um lives in London. Oh yeah. And she has um a daughter, and that daughter has a daughter, and that daughter you see. If you look in that thing called um, um, YouTube, mm -hmm. her name is Frankie Thompson. She's mm -hmm. a cabaret artist. She's 19. She's my great niece. Amazing. And I'm, I'm in the London Observer, and so is she. <laughs> and she's very talented. She's really very talented. Mm -hmm. um, she's going to be coming to New York. I think she may be in New York now and wants to come and see me. But... Um, it's funny how our family is spread all over the place like yeah. that. What's her name again? Frank? Frankie Thompson. Frankie Thompson, yeah. Yes, it's Francesca. Yeah. Okay. But she calls herself Frankie. Yeah. Great. So, so Denise, uh, what are you up to other than uh, partying with, uh, <laughs> with friends? Well, that, that's been the big thing now. No, yeah. I've been in touch with a student I taught at UCLA, mm -hmm. who then went with Aldo Jogola to work in Australia on the government house there. Mm -hmm. And um, he was an independent, very slight, small little boy when I taught him. Now he's a big practitioner in Australia worldwide, and that world does not mean Europe. It means, uh, you know, the, the China and places like that. And he's very sweet and nice. Mm -hmm. And so I've had a long, long Zoom like this with him. It took two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And what I'm talking about is, um, he said, look, explain to me what you meant when you said you became an architect at the age of two. Mm -hmm. And I did say that. 
And you showed the house that made me say that and the, what, my, what my mother made what me do. And my memory of before the house was built, we went with drawings and I saw blue page with white lines on it, which is the way they did working drawings. And I have strong memories of that. And then my mother j just drew for us all day and she read to us and we did coloring and coloring books and all of those things. And I, I was going to be an architect because my mommy was an architect. And then I went to kindergarten school and I loved my teacher, so I was going to be a teacher. And then after that, I forget what came next. I think I wanted to be a librarian, something like that. And then I wanted to travel a lot. And then by the age of 40, I looked around and I found the things I'd wanted to do at that age, I'd done. <laughs> it was a very nice, I said, by the age of 40 or maybe 50, um, everything I had thought of, I had, everything I met, I had already met twice before. Mm. And it was all those things. Now, the nice thing now is the friendliness of all those people last night, the people who come back and talk to me, and people like you, and then having a talk on a Zoom. Now, I, I forget the name for Zoom, and now I have to deal with how I remember things when I forget things, and I've got a theory for how you do that. But in the meantime, I say, look, I don't remember Zoom. I'll remember a word that I find funny that sounds like it, and I'll use that. So if I can't think of it as a Zoom, I'll call it Snood. <laughs> and then when I think of Snood, it makes me laugh, and then I think of Zoom. <laughs> and so I'm evolving theories like that for doing things. And mm. But I am talking to people with the aim, aim of, if I can't get my thing written about... Um, about um, getting away from the Athens Charter and toward what I call a bag of tools. And the bag of tools comes from urban sociology, urban economics, the land economy is called transportation. But also, I had a very old friend. I, I was um, teaching at Penn, and sometimes I would just put my head down and cry at Penn because There'd be no one there and no faculty were friendly with me. Um, Lewis Mumford was friendly with me. He'd lost a son and he was prepared to talk about it. But then I went to a talk by an ethnomusicologist whose, whose son I very much admired. Mm. So I went to his talk and he had come from, um, he, he studied at Harvard and then he went and taught in, um, at, at UCLA, but he'd come as a visiting professor for three months to the folklore department at Penn. And I heard a wonderful talk from him about popular culture and music. As I was looking at popular culture in architecture, he was looking at music. So I, after, and I was right at the front, he said he'd noticed me there. So after the talk, I did a very improper thing he was what they call a Boston Brahmin, which is a, a real gentleman from Boston. I called him and I said, um, you're a visitor here and I know how unfriendly Penn is with visitors. Can I take you for lunch? <laughs> he was very puzzled. And he said, yes. And we had lunch and we formed a friendship. That was 1963 and until he died, which was probably 1980. And I used to see him once a week in UCLA, and we'd go for a walk in the park, and he'd then sit and tell me his adventures as a sort of like a musical anthropologist, and what he discovered and what he saw. He'd advise me on my problems with the same thing. When I said, look, people say I'm too interested in design, and then when I get into analyzing, they say I'm too interested in analysis. So that's just my problem between form and analysis. And he described all of that. And I just felt I had a, a, a real loving friend in all of that. Um, he had, his son was Pete Seeger. Have you heard of Pete Seeger? No. Peter Seeger was a very, very famous folk singer in mm -hmm. America. And he, um, he wrote a, a book called um, 
Now, he wrote a music called Little Boxes. Mm -hmm. Little Boxes, okay. Little Boxes, yeah. da, 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 about how terrible Levittown was. Yeah, oh, yeah. Me, oh, Levittown, yes. of course. And, and then I explained to him about studio and how you learned in studio, just as I explained to you. He was, he was a communist, probably, Peter, and Charles was very, very left-wing. And he mm -hmm. says, the, the, the authorities have a, a book this thick about me, and they don't know how much they've missed. So yeah. I, I learned so though. much from him, and he was so old, and he knew all those people. And so it, it was, it, it was a, a support for me. And then I had this little, little college and cottage in Santa Monica, and Charles and I would have lunch at my cottage, or then at his house not far away. And then um, when Pete was there, Pete came for lunch, and I explained to him about studio and all of that. And then there was the Mexican Games, and Pete's daughter um, went to watch the Mexican Games, and they arrested her. They arrested her because she was the daughter of Pete Seeger, a well-known um, mm kind of liberal of some sort, and they didn't want any trouble. They put her in prison for nine months. Mm. And, they didn't, and his wife went to try to save her, and they said, you better leave or you'll end up in prison too. This was in Mexico. And then suddenly one day they took her in a plane, and they put her in a plane, and they dumped her in Austin, Texas. Mm. And someone had to come and pick her up. But I said, wasn't it terrible living in prison like that? He said, no, you know, it wasn't. All the, all the daughters of the leading um, intellectuals who were anti-government were put in that prison, and she learned so much from them. He said, it was her studio. <laughs> they, they said Pete was a very intelligent man. Yeah. So, so you, you taught a lot uh, during the 60s. Yes, um, from 19. But, but, then you, but then you stopped, more or less, in the early 70s. Well, you see, when I was, came into the office, yeah. the first year I was finishing off things that I wanted to do, and I know so well how you did manage to finish those things. There are about six unfinished books sitting in the archive. Mm. And now the archivists are saying, don't try to finish it, and don't get someone to finish it for you, because they'll get it wrong. Just mm -hmm. let us make it very available the way it is. Yeah. See, that's the best thing you can do for those things. So yeah. I'm thinking about that. But I, you see, I came in there and I earned no money at all for one year. And I got on with my stuff, but slowly their life was hard and they weren't making money. And I began to be able to get planning jobs. Mm. And so I began doing planning jobs because the office needed that money. And, mm -hmm. and then I, I did that and more things and then more things and then got involved with the, I have not worked with Bob on his houses, but everything else. And mm -hmm. the way you described, described how I brought into their planning, the notions of the relationships of the, you don't just put a, a tower and then a wall around it and then you show all these high rise buildings around. How mm -hmm. are the high rise buildings people going to get your tower? Well, there's going to be roads. For God's sake, think about those roads, and then you make your building different too. Mm. So that that's the story, and then you go even further out, and we flew over um, Toulouse. Yeah. And by the way, the, the the Swiss say Toulouse, and the French say Toulouse. Toulouse. It's the difference. Toulouse, Toulouse, and Toulouse. Well, I flew over it, and I said, "This build, this city, I can see its center is totally made of brick." So mm -hmm. I got my first urban relationships up in the air, and I've done that so much, flying over Africa, flying wherever I'm going, photographing as I go. So I saw this relationship, and then I saw, as you got nearer to where our site was, there were still medieval streets, but the houses had been replaced, and now they were mostly in brick and mortar, with mm -hmm. a, some, with some um, stone now and then. Mm -hmm. and, and the brick was not necessarily red, but some of it was. So I realized we had all these relationships. And then there was the canal, and then there was the highway. And then I remember the Smithsons. You see, I, I agreed with the Smithsons about shortcuts, 
But mm. I've learned about shortcuts by walking along donkey paths in the belt. And knew a whole lot more about donkey paths than the Corbusiers knew from living in the wilderness. I did it too. We, we did archaeological excavations in, um, it wasn't lion country, but it was leopard and mamba, mamba country where we went. Mm. And my getting to understand form and nature was very important to me. Mm. Yeah. So that's very interesting to hear. You mm. you said that the, the planning jobs were kind of saving the office in, in the mm. beginning of the 70s. And then I got into working on, like the, the one job that they are saying that I had something to do with. It, mm. Yes, I did. And that, you see, England was very involved in, the study of mannerism, mm. and America was not at all. They'd not heard of it. Mm. And then um, when I got to England, I, I was fascinated by it because I'd already been saying, um, the English just say we break the rules in Africa, but these are our rules. And now why, why shouldn't we do it the way we do it? Mm. And why, why do they look out? English people, they make a camera like that around their eyes. And you look, look through that, they say, that little piece there could be like Surrey. Yeah. And I say, why does our beautiful South African felt have to look like Surrey to be beautiful? Exactly. So, so, if that, so you break the rules of, of medieval cities when you deal, deal with African cities. And there were certain African writers writing very interestingly about that. One was called Rex Martinson. And the Smithsons had discovered Rex Martinson. And they were you know, um, the felt and the vast space mean you define space and cities differently from if you were in a medieval city. Mm. And I do, did a lot of thinking about that. Yeah. And um, so these are all the things that, that made it for me. Mm -hmm. Perhaps um, you have talked about John Summerson uh, sometimes, yes. your teacher at AA, and he talked about a mannerism, right? He, what he talked about teachers? it, and so did Nicholas Pevsner talk about oh, it. Oh, yeah, Nicholas Pevsner too. Yes. And, and you see, Robin Middleton, who was yeah. a good friend from South Africa, Pevsner mm. went to South Africa for a visit, and he noticed Robin. And Robin was outstanding. It's a tragedy Robin left architecture. Mm. <laughs> but um, so um, he, he persuaded the university, my university, to give Robin a full scholarship to Cambridge. Mm. So Robin came to Cambridge and he worked under Pevsner there. And so I had the, the Pevsner knowledge. We also had Pevsner's book. We had the knowledge from um, Somerton. These are all the things I've been telling the people at National Gallery. Yeah. I learned you know, about those and they, they just will not listen. They will not listen. They're mm. arrogant and they, mm. everything. So it's, it's a really sad thing, and I wish I could get a thousand. You know, when, that, when the Pritzker Prize came out, there was yeah. a petition sent, the Pritzker petition. Yes. So I think 22,000 people sent yeah, yeah, yeah. petitions. I want people from Switzerland and Australia, and I want them to say the eyes of the world are on you. What do you think you're doing? Yeah, we really need to get this petition going. It's, it's uh, at Well, it is going. It it's is there. It's up. Yeah. It's mm. up. You just yeah. have to send to it, but you have to ask your friends too. Exactly. So I'm I'm sharing as much as I can, but uh, I'm yes. I, this last week it was 100 people who signed, so that's at least something. But we need oh, to. Oh, that's marvelous. Yes. I, yeah, I yeah. haven't looked. Another thing is we had a a student who came here, and a friend of ours. You see, Harvard fires all their best professors. Their students mm. are the best of all. They take the best professors and they fire them. So she got fired and went to a school for poorer people. And she, mm. she called and she said, I've got the person who absolutely belongs with you. So he came to this house. And I was already by that time on um, lockdown because of COVID. And I was dancing along this balcony outside here. And mm. here we have a beautiful yard outside here yeah. and the balcony. So I was dancing along the balcony there and singing to klezmer music because it's the best music to dance to. Its rhythms are right for dancing. It makes you move like this quickly. 
and I mm -hmm. needed that exercise, particularly after I broke my femur, you see. And, and so he was outside there patiently tapping away at all the wrong plaster someone had put on our windowsills, and he got that off for us in the summer. So he was down there listening to me, and I was up there talking to friends. And, and he, was a, he was a poor kid who um, was very bright and very nice. And slowly we got to know, know, know more about him. And um, so I, I wrote to him when he went back to school. And I said, how, how was studio? How did the teacher go in studio? He sent me a letter. He said, oh, studio is just two, two 2020s. Nowadays, we do arias from balconies onto patios. Yes. <laughs> so with this kind of mind, he went back. And I said, send us the rules for how you, you go and investigate the rules for how people have to sign the, 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 that petition. Mm -hmm. He didn't send us the rules. He made himself the petition organizer and he sent it out and he got it going. Now, Richard Payne in London, who's another dear friend of mine, he yes. helps. And so in London, and he and, and um, also his name is... Um, Matthew Masseray, Masseray, it's yeah. Italian. And um, they worked together on the petition. And um, so, and he also does something else. He runs something called the Gio, Grio, Grio. And that's a, a Zulu or African pattern where old wise people come and talk to young people. And he set it up at his school for architecture where people like me, come and talk about their experiences to, mm. to young students. And I said to him, look, you know all my stories now. You've heard all of them. You go and be the Grio, not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the point is, he's doing it. He's running it. And he's very sharp. And he yeah. took away the thing we were writing about it. I, he, I don't know who he met in England. Someone brought him over to England. They worked together. And that person wrote a very, very good introduction. Excellent one. It is one. very good, yeah. I have yeah. a feeling it's a man called um, Jules Lubbock. Jules Lubbock. Okay. He's a very um, old man, but he was on the quiet, very secretly, the one who wrote that thing about the, 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 the first competition for that building that they cast out and hired us. The first competition... Mm -hmm. Look, that they built there a carbuncle on the face of a loved friend. Mm, yes. I, I think that was Jules, and I think the things I see there sound like Jules too, but he's not admitting it. He would yeah. be a nice person to talk to. He's a um, professor of architectural history at Essex University. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. He was Jules Lubitsch. Yeah. But he's changed his name. English Jewish people change their names to English names. So English people cannot pronounce for a foreign name. So he's Jules Lubbock. I see. But um, I was thinking of maybe we could, uh, can, if I may record a message for Instagram, <laughs> I think it could be quite helpful if you, Denise, could say, please sign the petition. And then I would, I would post that. I think that might help a bit. In Instagram. Do yeah. I say Instagram or do I say what? Yeah, you can just say, um, dear friends, please uh, sign the petition to save the Sainsbury Wing, yeah. something like that. Who, what friends? Oh, uh, <laughs> your, your, your people who, who like you, people who uh, love you even uh, in, in, you know, yes. all over the world. Um, I think I'll start and say about the petition about the Pritzker Prize. Yes. I, 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 I say it now. I yes, say, yes, dear friends, you remember the petition about the Pritzker Prize where everyone signed it and we got 22,000 petitioners before I, before I stopped looking? And some coined some wonderful phrases like um, one plus one is greater than two meaning a collaboration of Bob and me. Well, now we need you to put everything you can into trying to save the National Gallery. It's our best building. They are already demolishing parts of it. 
they have no understanding the the, the person who is running it does not believe in architects at all and knows very little about architecture and doesn't care and his followers are following him to perdition i believe and to great sorrow um summerson when he gave the lecture on um the bank of england there were almost tears in his eyes where he described how sir herbert baker a famous architect then and he built much in the colonies a famous architect ruined the facade of the Bank of England and part of the main hall of the Bank of England. He could hardly speak when he spoke it. And after that, Baker's reputation in England went to almost nil. But for all that, they'd lost a wonderful building and now they will be losing another one. I think English people would be sympathetic to hearing that people from all over the world are looking at them and blaming them for being blind in this thing. And it's no use saying, well, what's wrong with it looking this way or that way? The research we did, the findings we brought to this thing, the learning from their scholars that we used um, has not, is not being repeated in the, in the alternative. I've seen what I've seen and I know it will not be the right thing there and they should get themselves more aware so if you produced 55,000 from Switzerland alone and 22,000 from Australia and thousands from places where it comes in Chinese as well I wouldn't be at all unhappy it would be a lovely way of saving the building through the care of people who love architecture all around the world so sign the petition. Yes, please sign the petition. Say what you'd like to say. Some very wise things will be remembered by. I never forgot the thing about one plus two is greater than one plus one is greater than two. Bob plus me working together is more than just two people. Lovely. <laughs> I think I will post this. I hope it helps. Yeah. Yes, I hope so too. Maybe there are questions from the students. That's, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy. Great. <laughs> Denise is so lovely to, to, I, to talk. I would have this question, very simple one. Do you have an advice for the students or the future architects to where to focus on what's what, where, where? Yeah, do you have an advice for them? Um, how can I say? <laughs> Um, look at your environment, learn to love it, learn the ways of conveying what you need to convey as an architect. For example, I had, uh, during the war, they could not get science teachers, particularly for girls schools. And then we had to pass an exam where you had to have a science and our school brought in an English bot botany teacher. And we didn't have, I knew little about physics and various other things, but I had five hours of botany teaching a week, maybe more, maybe 10, for two years. I learned to draw plans. I learned to draw sections. I learned to draw systems, all the flowers, but I could put, pass that information over into architecture very easily. And... Um, I, just people encouraging me to be inquisitive about everything and then start working out where it's going to fit you. Um, other things were that my, my grandmother had in London many refugee friends. And um, as they came over from Latvia, she tried to help them find work. And one day when she was back living with us when the war ended and Many people left England just to get better food for a while, you see, after that. And she was living with us, and the phone rang, and someone phoned her and said, her name was Becky, Becky, do you remember me? And she said, um, you helped me find work in London. And now I've been here at the University of the Vitratis Run, my university, looking into 
um, a, a pre-human species, which became my specialty for the last, I think it was six months. I'm going home tomorrow and I didn't realize that you were in Johannesburg. I'm so sorry. Would you come to a lecture I'm giving? And then after the lecture, you could take me back to the hotel and we could talk. So my mother put my little sister in the car and I was 13, a squeaky voice. And um, we went there and the university was heaven for me because they had these great long ramps um, floored in linoleum and you could run and slide along the ramps and jump. And it was like having a play garden. Some of our friends, have, their dad was a, a big professor there and they used to go and play there and I'd go play with them. So it was nice enough to go to the university, see what I learned and how. And then the next thing was, there we were and he gave a talk and I could understand every single bit of that talk. And then the students got up and they asked questions and I could not understand a single word the students asked. I was already at my high school discovering the library and loving to sit and watch a converted old living room and look at all the books in the library and find ones I liked, not the ones the school had given me. So I'd learned that. Now here was this guy and how could I understand any of that? Now I had this high squeaky voice and I had the temerity to say to him, look, I understood everything that you said and I couldn't understand a word the students said. And he said, oh, students are always like that and smiling. And so I said to myself, I'm never ever going to teach that way. I'm always going to make sense. That's a big lesson I learned right then. Now, about three years ago, I began thinking, yeah, what was that man? I must, he must have become a famous man. Who was he? And I thought I remembered the name and I put the name down and I looked it up in Google and I found about eight pictures of him. And there it was, the first one looked very much like when I'd seen him when he'd been about 58. And it was Professor Bronowski. And most people in America have learned about Professor Professor Bonofsky as an archaeologist and a, you know they know him and they've studied his work. I had the joy of actually speaking to him and then we got involved in archaeology and um, I, I, you know, we used to go camping and looking for you know, the Stone Age implements and things like that. So I learned it in a very direct way that Americans didn't have the joy of doing. That Thanks interesting is that interesting to you? Yes, it is because it's it shows more a method. Yes. And not uh, a tool. So it's more a method to to be awake and to 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 learn about the world. Yes. It's always changing. It yes. will never be even I see it on right what I learned in the 90s in my studies. I would not be able to survive with that knowledge. Yes. And it's much more important to be awake and to 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 realize and experience and 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 check what happens outside uh, to to be um, to be part of the actual discussion and not to use the solutions from yesterday for yes. the problems of today. Yes. Now, I have many other illustrations, but I think everyone's probably going to be bored. I, I posted the, the link to the petition now, so so uh, everyone can uh, oh, read the wonderful you. text and uh, so on. Share it also, thank please. you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> look, good, good luck to all of you, and it's been charming. I had another very nice one, you know, with. Um, now, what's what's a university where um, um, I'm forgetting the names? Um, the, the other Swiss university that's just near here that stressed research near you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I I I had a nice nice conversations with them too. Mm -hmm. um, At the Academ Academia in Mendrisio. Uh, no, it's it's it's. No, I'm just trying to remember the name of the EPFL town. EPFL in Lausanne? Yes, EPFL. 
Yeah. Yes, and they, they're very nice, and they like. I've also talked with them about research and, and all of that. And then it took, you don't do this, but they sent me some big, big bars of chocolate with, oh. with an extra package on the Toblerone and my name printed on that. Oh, so great. Don't do that. I just get too fat. <laughs> but they were very sweet. They're nice people there. Mm. Yeah. great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are there some other questions at the moment, or shall we leave you? Take, take the chance, students. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone. I, I don't know. Can, I don't, can students ask questions from where you are? Yes, they are switched on. I never do it. Uh, I never do anything very close. So it's uh, it's more an open thing. So everybody mm -hmm. participate if it's possible. Well, does someone want to ask me a question? Yes, please. Question. Yeah. Too shy. Um, no, no oh, Katerina. Um, my name is Katerina. Um, well, I don't know what to ask. I'm still a student, still at the start of it. Um, but I thought I'll ask what, 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 what do most architects, uh, architects miss and what should we make sure to not miss? Well, popular culture, um, uh, 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 being open to different ideas, um, um, they, they, you know, they say you work so hard that you miss you miss what do they say you miss the roses in the in the ball in the in the as you go by because you're working so hard. And I say um, I don't miss them. They're all sitting on my drawing board. You don't, you don't have to miss the things. And then another another thing that I. I was at a conference. Um, I, I went to Iran, and people later at one of these recent the Yale conference, they asked me, um, "What did I make of Iran?" And I told them about going up into the mountains to see um, a woman-based industry of um, weaving rugs out in the open. The rugs stayed out in the open. If it rained, it rained on them. And they went by the road, and there were all these women there. And um, so I, I described that conference. It was before um, Iran became independent, but Shabanu had invited us, and she paid for us, about five women she did that for. And, um, and I said, my, the, the, the Shabanu had friends who were all socialists, young women socialists. And they, they called me their fascist friend. At least they said I was a friend, but I was fascist because I was American. And so eventually, at the very end, they trusted me enough. And they said to me, um, what is it like to be an architect and have a baby? And I said, um, you, it was drawing board time. You will have your drawing board there, and you'll be working on your drawing board. And higher up on the drawing board, there'll be a crib, and there is the baby and you will love it. Now, I forgot to say that will last about a month, and then the baby will start waking up. But it, I really felt that I had this lovely thing with this little baby sitting there, and I'm drawing, and how could life be better than that? And, um, and I said, you will love it. They all said, and we love you. Yes, we can confirm that. <laughs> well, it, yes. it, was, it was just it was lovely to see I did it partly there because that those women seemed so fierce so what I did was I got the photograph of our little baby and he was about 18 months old I passed it round about a, a few hundred of them on the street as went round like it. I watched him holding it so carefully passing it to one to the other not to hurt me not to hurt it and it came all the way around and didn't disappear. And here it was given back to me. And it was such a beautiful gesture. What do I learn? I learn from things like that. Lovely. Yeah. What I think is really um, a super 
to 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 listen to you and 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 up to now it's it's that you're you you're still curious about what happens in the world it's a curiosity which is not just focused into let's say the architecture let's say urbanism art um it's 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 much more about the human being and it's, well, it's well, you see, to bring these well, together one of our professors said to us in planning school, planning school, they're much more free minded than the architects. And he said, look, you architects design living spaces, public spaces, and it's largely ignored by the public. And then the public goes in great crowds to Las Vegas. Why don't you go to Las Vegas and find out what's happening to draw the crowds there and not to what you design? That was a Mr. William Wheaton, and he was a, um, he taught introduction to city planning. He was a politician. He was all sorts of things, and a very good friend. Yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's the biggest advice one can give: to be open-minded and curious. What happens? Yes. Um, I'm I, I'm proud that that you know our son has grown up to be even from a little boy very open-minded and not always but it's just you know it's it's nice to see that we we were in in Switzerland we were in Geneva and there's a very nice restaurant which is run um, by a school that teaches. Um, how to, people how to be restaurant managers and owners and uh, I think people come from all over to study there and it's in a nice old barn and the food is fairly cheap and you're waited on by learning restaurateurs and um, our son was about 12 and I was and we had his cousins with him as well from London and we were all in Geneva to see my family. We could get together as a family, you see, um, from Geneva. And so I, I began doing the ordering. My mother would order for herself, and I'd order for the ones who couldn't speak um, English or, or, or French. Eventually, Jimmy ordered for himself in French. I was very proud of him. But I was ordering carefully in French with this young waiter who was there. And I got to Jimmy. And um, it was just, he, I'd already ordered for him the food, but it was something to drink. And this young waiter came up and, and looked at Jimmy. And said, Jimmy, what, what will you have to drink? And I saw Jimmy looking at this waiter very hard. And he said, I'll have a Coke. <laughs> and the waiter said, I thought you'd never ask. So Jimmy learned the perception to see he was being waited on by a very polite American who was letting us struggle in French. If you would have the possibility to, to write a book or design a building mm. or something, what would you, or to teach, what would you like to do? Or what would you be a dream of doing something um, still as an active person in, I think, in the society? Well, if you take me at my age now, yes, I've got course. it. I'm doing what I what I should be doing. Listen to what I'm talking to you about. That's what I should be doing. And what I hope is that people will begin to try to learn. There's lots of kinds of learning and um, body learning where you make signs. I walked out of a lecture with my hands like that. See, like that. Yes. And I said, let's take it that those are two busy crossroads. Now, where would the high-rise building go? Well, of course, they knew right in the middle there. Then where would still a commercial building, but not so high-rise go? Over here. Where would the housing go? All around here. And I want to get it into their body like that. And they all walked out like that. Even their teachers walked out like that in the lecture. And... Um, what I was saying is you've just worked out for yourself something called central place theory. You know, a, a town grows like this and then it grows more 
and then you get outlier towns. And in an agricultural district, you will see those patterns. You won't see them where there are great cliffs and things, other things happen. But you can see those patterns evolving naturally. Um, and the man who evolved that theory was called von Thunen. He was from Prussia. And he rode around in his lands and he saw that cars were grazing near the abattoir, less cost to get them to, to um, the abattoir and then to market. And sadly, that also became the basis for the concentration camps, which means some of these people, a man called Christella, no one talks about because his developed theory was used by the Nazis for just that purpose. But um, apart from that, the, the, um, the, the, the thought that that is how things actually form and that you can understand them and see how they work. And it's not, you can make them very, very, very highly computerized. Um, central place theory has got all sorts of mathematical urban models. And I talked with the, the originator, Walter Izard. He was one of my professors too. Like, like Charles Seeger, Walter Izard was a good friend and also my professor. And he said, um, use your judgment. And then when you need some help, use my programs. And he had the skill of, um, I'd be in a class and I couldn't do all that mathematics. And these people would be getting their doctorates and they'd be in the class too. He'd ask me the right questions that I could answer and he'd ask them the questions they could answer. I learned that from him. Chris and Dave, you had a question, you raised your hand. No, I'm fine, thank you. Scared? Yeah, probably a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, just checking if something happens and then reacting. Someone wants to ask me a question in French. I'm not sure how good I'd be, but I try. Or German, even. Well, German, I'm not so good, but I could do some of it. Very I slowly. <laughs> we always translate the thing. That's not really a problem. Um, <clears throat> I, th I, but what, what I really admire is, 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 is that you even travel to artists, with the students, not just you, 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 if the students. But I realized it, it was when you, for example, when you went to Las Vegas, you went even to add. Roche in his, in his studio to see his work and so on. But you were yes. just convinced that he really understood what he's doing. Uh, well, that was a big surprise because, you know, I had been doing it before him, taking little ordinary houses and things. And I found this book with his little houses in the bookshop in Santa Monica. And it's, by the way, that book sells at about $600 now or something, a collector's item. But the point is that um, when I took my students to meet them, and they were all about the same age, and to our amazement, he could not really say what he was doing there. And he said some things which I thought were just, he just didn't understand at all. He, he looked at the, that um, sculpture by Andy Warhol of, um, well, also a painting of a, of a, a, a tin can with things sticking up out of it. And he said, um, Andy Warhol painted that tin can because it had Art Nouveau writing on it, and that was pretty. Well, it certainly wasn't Art Nouveau, that writing. And I don't think that's the reason Andy, but he just didn't know. And in the end, it came to a sort of a stop. I left, the students stayed on with him, they got a big keg of beer, and they did what students do, they had a party. I don't think he talked much about art. I think I learned more from Andy Warhol. And as you can see, I learned a whole lot from people like Charles Seeker. Um, Denise, uh, may I ask you something? There is a photo uh, taken by Andy Warhol of you uh, early, uh, early 70s. Can you uh, tell us something about that uh, meeting with him? Here it is. Did he take it? Yes, Andy Warhol. 
I've never seen that, you know. Yeah. And this is the way <laughs> I looked at the 70s. Taking in 1971. Well, you see, we all had, um, it was a group of artistic um, patrons. Their names were Lewis, mm -hmm. Francis and Sidney Lewis. And they ran what would be called an outlet store. It sold out in the suburbs, um, washing machines and things like that at a cheap price. And they were great art collectors as well. And every time they built a new outlet, they bought a painting from a pop artist and put it there in that store. Nice juxtaposition for people like Bob and me. And then they'd have a party and they'd send their private airplane and pick up people and bring them all to where they were um, in the South. And um, we have a great party there. And then once they took us and Andy Warhol, and I don't remember who else, they took Bob and me traveling in Italy once, so that was great with, with them in Italy. But then they took Andy Warhol and Bob and me, and I forget, a couple of other people. Um, and we had, a, um, we, we traveled in the South looking at museums and looking at art in those museums. And we had a great time. And Andy was probably the friendliest he would ever be with us then. And that wasn't all that friendly. But it, it, was a, it was a fun time. And that's where that came from. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yeah, I'd I love to have a copy of it. Where did you find it? Oh, um, so it was one of the authors who suggested it for, for the book. So I, I haven't found it myself, I must say. Uh, uh -huh. But it well, would be good enough that I've it. got it in the book. Yes. Yeah, it is in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, interesting to hear more about about that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I caught myself trying to imitate Andy Warhol and give the same sort of funny answers that he gave to people. And I realized, no, that's not me. I cannot going to do that. That's good that you decided to stay Denise. Yes. That's what or like. at least try to find out what I was. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Yeah. You know, okay. I, should have, I should have said that you know, when my first husband was killed, that was an amazing blow to me. And I had to learn and recover and, and the students helped me enormously, yeah. more than the faculty. But it was, it was just, just like that. And mm. um, we had such a marvelous time. And he had a very interesting background. His father was Scottish and a lawyer and in South Africa, and his mother was half Jewish. And um, uh, her, her grandfather um, had, had a, a brother, and that brother was called Lucian Wolf, Lucian Wolf. And you can go to any Jewish encyclopedia, and there's Lucian Wolf. He was called the British, he was a journalist. He's called the British Foreign Minister to the Jews, for the Jews. Where there was a pogrom anywhere in Europe, he would be sent. He was a very dapper man. He wore a top hat and coattails, morning suit, and um, kid gloves, lavender kid gloves. And he would go and visit the shtetl where these people were, and he'd come back saying, news of, of, a, of a pogrom is greatly exaggerated. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was or not, but that's what he was like. And he's known to everyone. And when I met Isaiah Berlin, who was on the board of the National Gallery, and he became a good friend. And he had just given a memorial lecture for Lucien Wolf. <laughs> He was very, he, he, he was, he was an interesting man, as I believe, but that evening we had dinner with the Sainsbury's and Prince Charles came and Prince Charles um, looked at the drawings and said he liked them and all of that. And then Prince Charles left and I started talking with Isaiah Berlin and I showed him all the people I knew that he would know one way or another. And counting 
Charles, he nevertheless said, this part of the evening was the most fun he's had at a dinner party in a very long time. It's very interesting how you, <clears throat> just thinking about, you went to the CM summer school, mm -hmm. you uh, participated there, <clears throat> but still, you 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 have a, a quite a different opinion on 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 let's say Le Corbusier and this approach there. Yes, but you and, know when when we were there and in Venice, the people were, were really loving with us. The old participants, Albini, Gardella, and all those people, and I I spoke French there because some of them didn't speak English, and I told them they. They'd spoken too much and not let, not let us do our work. A cheeky student. And uh, Gardella came up to me and said, Vous avez dit une chose poétique, and shook my hand. And so, um, but, but the point was, they saw in us the way we, we, we were feeling now, the way had, they had felt before, and they said, um, modernism was a beacon for freedom for us. And then we went with their help, with the help of um, Ludovico, what was his name, uh, another uh, um, Italian architect. Um, he introduced us to, find, um, what, what am I, why, why am I making, um, the, the architect we worked for in Rome. Maccaro. Uh, um, Maccaro, um, yes. yes. And to, you see, Carolina was a, 15 months old baby in a pushcart at that time. She's my good friend now. She's an old lady like me. But so we worked for them and they had a, 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 a apartment and in the apartment was a retarded child. There was also Carolina. There was Leda, who was an artist and his wife and his receptionist. And we came there and we worked in there and we did um, babysitting and we picked up some tacks because Carolina would get hurt and every now and then she'd get in the drawings we'd hear the smash 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 in the drawings and um, I decided I wanted an office like that but also we learned so much from Vaccaro he was a very serious person very shy rather horrified at the amount of work he was having to give me and keeping on apologizing and all of those were experience. These are building experiences. But nevertheless, uh, you you did not really participate in Team Ten afterwards as a reaction against this this thing, or how do you see your position with the movement in Team Ten, which really tried to renovate this modernism? You wanted to do something different, if I understood. Well, you see, I came very much. The reason we went to Penn was because Peter Smithson, who liked Robert Scott Brown very much, and Peter Smithson said, the only place you should go is where Lou Kahn is. Now, Lou Kahn was diverting from modernism in some way, and he was doing a chunky style of thing at that time. And, but we were there to learn from him because he had had also um, lots of conferences during the reform movement, there was a democratic reform movement in Philadelphia. And these were the, the rich sons of rich Republicans who had become Democrats. So they were still haughty and all of that, like their fathers, but they were, they were looking for democratic values and they were looking to make a plan for Philadelphia that followed democratic values. And we were very tied in with that and learned a lot from Lou. But then I went into planning school and I learned even more from German refugees like Herbert Gams, you see, much more. And um, Walter Isard, um, another one. And, and, and also a man called Britton Harris. And so I, I began putting together something where we began to talk about mannerism as I'd learned it from, um, you see, Bob, didn't learn about mannerism one bit when he was in Italy because they were not doing it. And then some visiting historians came from somewhere and they took him on a trip to 
see the, the work of Brazzini. It's the first time he heard anything about mannerism. And he said, that's what I want to do. And he came back to Philadelphia and he had, you know, his father was head of a fruit and produce business and his father was dying and he had to run that business as well as the architecture. And then as he was doing that, um, he found no one at Penn who knew anything about mannerism. I'd read um, Pevsner's book and I'd read all the stuff from, from um, but I wasn't there. I was sitting in the planning school, you see. And you know, Dave Crane assured me that I would get a studio with Lou Carl as well. But he said, look, this will be so good for you for when you go back to Africa. And by the way, Lou, Lou Carl noticed me immediately because I did things that other people didn't do. I didn't know. There'd be um, a, a, a jury going on. And at the AA, when there was a jury, if you wanted to support something in your friend's project, you could get up and talk too. So I saw something that I thought one of my friends wasn't being well treated by. And I got up and I put my hand up and I talked about how the neighborhood unit was a pretty dull idea and it's, I had its time now. I was learning that from Herb Gans. So everyone turns around. And Lou Kahn turned around and I saw a smile of triumph on his face. I said, what's that triumph doing on his face? What did I do? It took me about 40 years to work out what that triumph was for. But I eventually did. But the point was they were all horrified because I did that because he didn't do that there. But at the same time, there was an old man there. And this is what made our dean even mad at me. He said, yes, well, separating the automobile and the pedestrian was rather what we had wanted to do at, I forget the name of the famous uh, city that he designed. But this was a man called Stein, and he had invented the, the whole theory of the, of the neighborhood unit. And um, there I was saying it was useless. He was very polite to me. Lou was thrilled by me. The dean was spitting fire with his eyes at me. Um, I think we could continue for hours, probably. Well, um, but uh, it's your birthday, so I don't want to make it too long, because it's really it was so fantastic to have you here and to talk yes. with you. Well, you. You see, if you ask, what am I doing? This is what I'm doing. I'm wanting you people to remember this and yeah. use it. And I'm wanting you to think back. That's just one other thing. Remember your, your memories as a, as a two-year-old. Don't scorn those and see how they grow with you. I say it is, you know, when Le Corbusier says there's this, the, the play magnificent and correct of sun on solids, on, on solids. Well, that started with me as a child with pillboxes, you see, little round things. Then I began learning about these things. And then I associated them with his things. And that's been a theme in my life from about two years old all the way through now. And you have things in your own lives which you should use as well as the things that you learn from modernism and from school. Mm, beautiful. Very good. Okay. Very good. Okay. <laughs> beautiful way to end. <laughs> I, just, um, I just want to say something that's what we really can learn. It's uh, this was you in Grimarish some ten years ago or something like this. Yes, I remember. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an int it's really you take you take the people serious. Uh, it's not just about being in the big cloud of the theory or whatever. Mm -hmm. This um, it's really this 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 being awake and 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 and, and to talk. Yes. about the actual problems of today this is really we can something we can take with us and oh, continue when i worked for the people on south street oh exactly. they were wise that was a black community that was being sent out of its place of origin um so that they could put an expressway there they were my best clients ever and the thing is that, that they taught me well for example um, some people from the planning school came and said, oh, it's so nice to see the community is, is um, uh, collaborating in all of this. And then, I, I, and then 
And he said, you know, it would be really good. You could do a land use survey for us. And um, the, Alice Lipscomb, who was the matriarch of that community, she was a wonderful woman. She says, yes, and we go and find out all that information and you, you'd use, us, use it to clear us out of this place. We wouldn't do that for you. And you know, I, I learned other wisdom like that from transportation planners about how to handle things like that. But really, they were, and then at, at a certain point, I had my hand drawings up. We did all this work for no money for four years. And it was just, it was lovely work to do, but I'd done it all myself by hand. And they said, well, we leave it up overnight and then we'll start again in the morning. And they said, he said, those drawings are works of art. Don't leave them up on the wall. And no one's ever called it one of my drawings of works of art before or since. Wonderful. Anyway, off you go and off I go. And exactly this, we are at the moment preparing an exhibition in Tallinn for the Architecture Biennale as a, as a curator. And one of the basic questions we already had at the beginning was the human resource. Yes. And mm -hmm. Yes, and the humans won't let you use their resources against them. They shouldn't. <laughs> and it's a basic thing you need to do to be able to create uh, architecture and spaces. And, 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 and of course, things have changed a lot recently. But uh, I'm quite sure that it's important to be awake. And it's not just the technique will, which will bring us forward. It's the thinking, it's the openness, and uh, the, the, the clearness what, what, of, of, yes. of, of society and the, and the movement. And it's a re it was a big lecture today to, to understand that um, things are much more interlinked. And the openness to understand these links, the sensibility to understand these links. Yes, exactly. It's, it's a, it's it's a big thing it's a, it's a bigger thing than just the the, the 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 mechanical finding of solutions yes yes and therefore i'm i'm extremely honored that we are, were able to be guests at your birthday and as well you Rita, thank you very much for preparing everything and the organizing the whole thing it was really Thank fantastic you. for me and for the students and for us i think to have this talk and to have this possibility it's uh it's 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 it's, it's a great honor and we wish you really a fantastic birthday and we hope you really have a have a great day as it continued as it continues yeah well, thank you very much thank you and that's an honor for me too <laughs> yeah yeah Peter, you still want to say something? No, no, I, I, um, it's really, I, I can also only thank you and thank Denise. And uh, it was really, really lovely uh, to, to have this uh, moment together. So, yeah. have a very great day, great day. Thank you very much. Thank and you very much. Birthday. Hope to see you soon again, Good Denise. <laughs> take good care. You yeah. You take good care. Have, and have fun. And Frida, you. you're the hard, most hardworking woman in the world. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> See you. Bye. Bye.